Okay, so I'm back. Uh, let's see how my scan's going. That's looking at over QuickBooks. I've got a lot of, I've got about 20 gigabytes of files on here, so it's going to take a while. I guess just give you an idea of what's going on. But you get an idea. That's a very good presentation to, to look at. Here's the phishing page he's talking about. Looks just like Wells Fargo. If you bank at Wells Fargo, that looks at like what your bank pages normally looks like. In fact, uh, you know, one of the things you're told to do is look up here to see whether or not whether or not it says Wells Fargo and all at the end it, at the end it says dot dot you know dot hacker at uh, bad domain or something. But it has the, it has the right domain there. It's it's doing SSL that all looks legitimate, and it's not caught by any of the any of the phishing detectors. Of course, it asks for things like first name, last name, date of birth, social security number. So if you ever see that, just don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> even though it looks legit and I, I would if I hadn't seen this presentation I, I might even fall for it myself seeing that secure socket layer was there so whoever's done this is, has an absolute there's absolute ingenuity behind this whole system these um, these botnets rely upon uh, the fact that they can register their domain names with some very odd looking domains that are out there you know, like zxqy2x10.com, you know, and um, and there are people who actually will register those names, and so they'll stay at one domain for a couple of weeks, they'll switch to another domain for a couple of weeks, and the, the botnet depends upon that domain name because they get they get instructions. The, the botnet doesn't know. The designer of the, the botnet knows that he's he can't predict the IP numbers of all the computers that are going to be used. So he has to rely on DNS resolution and he has to register he has to register an, associ register an association between IP address and um, this, that's what's called domain flex. So maybe he'll he'll do this. And so if you use a, uh, if the command and control server uses a, a static IP address uh, then you can block or remove that host so you, you can't go, go to that domain or if you're uh, law enforcement, you can go there and physically capture the machine. And they actually had done that in the past for one of the TorPic machines where they actually captured one and got a lot of, a lot of data on it from that and found out it was compromised. Okay, so, but remember this is an arms race. You know, it's the hackers against the good guys and it's constantly, you, you start uh, thwarting the common way that they're doing things and they raise the bar, okay. And so the first thing they did to raise the bar was something called Fast Flux. And with Fast Flux, you have the same domain name all the time, but where it goes to, uh, it changes. Okay? And uh, in this case, you just block it. And what do you mean by where it goes to is the IP address? So for a few minutes, my IP address might be associated with the domain name they've registered. Then for a few minutes, it might be some other computer in Argentina. And then for the minute, you know. So it's hard to f to catch this, and there's and they use a peer-to-peer -peer network, and all these compromised computers are also able to send out junk uh, network communications to their target, whether it be Google.com or Yahoo or Semantic or McAfee.com, uh, to at least make the the website temporarily unavailable. And sometimes these compromised um, w uh, websites will just be on some personal computer sitting on your desk. You don't even know you have a web server running in there with SSL in the background. All these features that are that come stock and with uh, out of the box from Windows all help the um, the person that is committing these crimes. So he's got a whole system in place. And at the end of the day, they don't even know who the guy is that, that that ran this whole thing. The only way they could be caught is if someone turns them in. And so as long as they stay anonymous, it, it's just, it's, it's a lot of power, and there's no way to catch the person doing it. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then every 20 minutes, the bot attempts to connect in, tor in order to the weekly domain name dot com, the weekly... And if that fails, and what I mean by if it fails, if that domain's not available, it's not out there, or if it connects to that domain 
and that domain doesn't respond in an appropriate way, doesn't, doesn't have the right protocol, uh, then it'll go to WD.net. If that fails, it'll go to roll over to WD.biz. If all three of those fail... Now, WD, what he means by that is week of the year is a number, and D is day of the, of the week. So it might be uh, third, day, third day of the week and 52nd week of the year, that would be 523, right? So in the past, while we were watching for a pig, it turns out that the criminals normally register WD.com and sometimes WD.net. Okay, so which is, so they're, they're interested in efficiency. First one it's going to, they get. And uh, so what, if you go on, so what we did is, is uh, we wanted to get them to come to us instead of going to the criminal. Okay? And so first thing we did is reverse engineered the name generation algorithm and, uh, and figured out what the command and control protocol was. And as is always the case, one of our grad students noticed that the criminals hadn't registered WD.com or WD.net or any of those for about three weeks out from what the current date was. So we went and registered those domain names. <laughs> and then that's how they got control of the system. Because we're all going to be phoning home to his computer now that he can say, for this IP address, it goes to this IP number, not that one over there. Based on the domain name registry system, all the signals were going to his computer, and they had already reverse engineered the commands, and so they had control of the botnet. And later on, he's going to go into the details about how he um, was afraid of doing anything. Okay, so here's my scan results. So um, they skipped 102 files, 1,000, you know, and there was one warning. And the problem is. I don't know what the warning was. So the way for me to handle that, and it would probably be better, is if I redirected the output to avscan.txt. That way it won't come up on the screen, but instead it will populate a uh, file in my home directory, I would think. Um, Maybe not. So I'm really wondering what that warning was. And I, uh, so maybe it'd be in the log area. Or I have to, I'm going to look at et cetera AV scan to find out where that log is and see what the warning was. I think I saw it. I think I had it on screen for here. The Vira. AVGuard.com. I'm going to search for the term log. Verilog Avigar. So let's look at that. And usually logs are in the ver directory <laughs> and within the log directory. But not in this case. Hmm. Well, I can always look at do details, sort it by date, see what was the last thing. Here's a warning. What does it say? Okay, it says Windows uninstall flash plugin was not completely scanned. And I wonder why, and I wonder what I could do with the options to get this to work the way I want it. So I have exactly what I want here. That is the warning. So if I can somehow clear this, I can figure out what I want to do. So now I'm going to look at the options. And uh, I've skipped over doing the, um, the GUI. I think I'm just going to do that one. So I'm not going to do AV scan minus S. I'm going to do edit P. 
paste of my log and see what it does. Worn not completely scanned. Processing error. So I, I don't know what that is. I'll just stop here and after I have the answer, I'll come back.